Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody back, Alabama Care. We are in Homewood, Alabama today at the Children's Rehabilitation Services location. And we have Mrs. Betsy Hobson, the STEP Program Director at Children's of Alabama, and Mrs. Virginia Redeker, the Transition Specialist at Children's Rehabilitation Services. And today we're gonna to be talking about the STEP Program and transitioning to adult healthcare. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over. Mrs. Hobson, if you would introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me to talk with you today about the STEP program. Um, my name is Betsy Hobson, and I am the director of the STEP program, which stands for Staging Transition for Every Patient, and that's um, a program through uh, UAB. And then I'm also still the director of the Spina Bifida program at Children's of Alabama, which is what most people in Alabama know me from. Um, I've been very active um, working with patients with Spina Bifida for the past 15 years, and um, through my work with in, in that role, I developed transition protocols and a transition clinic and transition preparedness strategies for patients with spina bifida, which is what really led me into developing the STEP program for all patients. Yeah, it sounds like kind of a natural progression there of helping uh, kind of a smaller group to helping a larger group in that transition. Correct. Right? Yeah, and spina bifida was a nice population to start with because they really spanned many disciplines across the health system. Mm -hmm. Now, are you originally from Alabama? No, actually I'm from Atlanta, and so I began my career at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, where I worked in the same capacity and with a specific population, um, but it was with hemophilia in Atlanta. And we always like to ask, is it War Eagle or Roll Tide? It's definitely War Eagle. I write lots of checks to Auburn since my daughter's a senior <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Um, Mrs. Redeker, if you would introduce yourself. I'm Jenny Redeker. I am one of three transition specialists here at the Homewood CRS office. Um, I'm also one of the social work administrators here, and um, here at CRS, we consider transition from age 12 to 21, and so I serve clients with that age range um, in Jefferson and Walker counties. And are you originally from Alabama? I am not. I'm from New Jersey. And we always like to ask, uh, Roll Tide or War Eagle? Roll Tide. I got my master's degree here at Alabama. Awesome. Well, you guys heard it first. Roll Tide and War Eagle. <laughs> so they're <laughs> not going like to be watching the <laughs> Um, now, today we're going to be talking about the STEP program and, as we mentioned, transitioning to adult health care. Uh, Mrs. Hobson, if you would introduce the STEP program. Yeah, absolutely. So the STEP program has been in the making for about two years, and it was born out of um, a need that was first realized by the Health Service Foundation at UAB. The pediatric group of that foundation really set and said, what's a priority or an initiative that affects pretty much every discipline across the health system, and transition was the topic that they landed on. And in kind of a long story, that led them to reach out to me because I had developed a successful transition program for spina bifida, and then also Dr. Carly Stein, um, who is a MedPeds trained physician, who's the medical director of the STEP program. Um, but initially, we decided that we needed to approach STEP from both um, health institutions, UAB and Children's. And even though um, all of the physicians at Children's of Alabama are UAB, or UAB faculty, they're still separate institutions. And mm -hmm. so we began working on a program that had two arms. One would be um, the work that would happen at UAB after transition had, had taken place, and then the work that would happen at Children's Hospital to prepare patients for transition. Sounds kind of like a natural transition there from Children's to UAB as you go from younger pediatric care to, to more long-term adult health care there. Correct. Awesome. Uh, and Mrs. Redeker, um, you mentioned uh, Children's Rehabilitation Services. How does that play a role in the STEP program? Um, so we are providing community resource support right now for STEP. Um, Carly and I got to talking a f probably earlier in on the STEP program vision about how CRS was implementing extremely similar strategies um, on our end with our clients as to what they were doing at Children's and how wouldn't it be great if we could kind of collaborate a little bit more on that because it's often a lot of the same kids. And it led us to talking more about how to make that transition from uh, pediatric medical care to adult smoother. And then let us, as um, as your neighborhood, you know, state agency, to offer that support once the clinic was ready to be up and running. So CRS actually provides um, all of our transition workers plus our TBI specialists provide support for Betsy in the clinic, so that she has access to people who may have known the families from a very long, long health history, 
in the community education and kind of home realm, a little bit outside the hospital setting. Mm -hmm. And so we try to collaborate and provide assistance as we develop transition readiness goals and create plans of care so that our families can integrate into all of the pieces of transition since we know it is so much bigger than just our, our healthcare setting. Yeah, I love it. I love the collaboration there and I feel like it's happening more and more. Like we, we do some broadcasts with Lakeshore Foundation mm -hmm. and they're doing quite a bit of stuff with UAB you know, to do a lot of the data and the collection and analyzation of some of that stuff. Um, and so to hear, you know, the different organizations and agencies around the state that are you know, working on similar problems come together, it reminds me of uh, the story where <clears throat> if you have a horse pulling a cart, one horse might be able to pull a thousand kilograms or you know pounds, but if you have two together, they can pull five. Uh, so it's kind of compounding interest there. Uh, so that's very exciting. Yeah. Um, so why exactly, we'll give a little bit of background about uh, some of the pain points of why the STEP program is needed for individuals and families. Yeah, so, um, you know, again, going back to kind of the genesis of this program and when the providers sat down and, and looked at an issue that spanned across all of their clinics, transition was what came up. And because really every single patient is impacted by transition. When I'm talking to families about this, I really like to talk about the, the idea of lifespan care, or lifetime model of care, thinking about all of the different transitions that we go through. Um, and patients, and, and my patients can certainly relate to the different areas that they've gone through transition, things like, you know, going from tying their own shoe, their parent tying their shoe to tying their own shoe, or brushing their teeth, you know, by being told to doing it on their own. Um, so there's all, all these transitions that individuals are making. Um, but healthcare transition can be a time where there's a whole lot of anxiety around that for families. Us as providers, pediatric providers, become like family to um, our patients and to their caregivers. And when you think about it, we're there during their scariest moments and their darkest moments. And we have done a lot of hand holding and a lot of care coordination and held all of those pieces together. So going into an unknown system like adult health care that can be very complex and overwhelming um, can cause a lot of anxiety. And so when you really get down to talking to the patients and to their parents um, and find out the fear that's behind that, it really kind of highlights the need for a program like this that can have a foot in both worlds where, you know, I'm equally at Children's Hospital and at UAB in my position, um, the physician that run the STEP clinic are MedPeds trained, so they're licensed in pediatrics and adult medicine. And so where you can say to a family, we're literally with a foot in both worlds with you until we get you fully implemented into an adult health system. Yeah. It's important to keep in mind that healthcare transition is only one piece of, of what's occurring for most families as they enter into those um, 19 to 21, that age range, because we're also seeing changes in health insurance. We're seeing changes in school options. Um, we know that at 21, um, you're no longer gonna be eligible for IDEA school services, which is a huge transition for many families and devastating for some. We know that you're gonna lose your children's rehab support system. We know that a lot of those things that you've come to rely on to create your family few seconds here and just reboot the wireless mic so you guys can hear the audio clear uh, and in the meantime you can hear my beautiful voice uh, <laughs> singing a song if you guys want to hear me sing a song in future broadcasts go ahead and put it in the chat <laughs> you better hope <laughs> yeah. they say no <laughs> is it better okay. now so, okay. so you were saying there's a lot of things other than medical mm -hmm. um, that are happening during this transition. Right. It's a little bit like a new diagnosis to some extent. Um, when you first, uh, as a parent, when your child is newly diagnosed, you're creating this whirlwind network of people that then become your, your go-tos. And at transition, you're kind of forced back into that role again. Um, you're having to create a new network. And it's, it's a bit traumatizing, I think, for some families, understandably so. And when we can say, hey, I've had your case, CRS has had your case for, for since you were three years old, and guess what? I'm gonna be there at your first adult doctor's appointment. My face will be there. Someone you know that you've known since you first were diagnosed is gonna be there for you. Um, I, th I hope that it lessens some of that anxiety and, and doesn't um, cause it to be as traumatizing of an experience. 
I like how you, you kind of hit on there is creating that network and that new team because that's that's some a lot of the stuff that we talk about is the supported decision making team, um, you know, and how to surround our loved ones with people that will support them over their lifespan. And, and you're kind of going from that early part of that to maybe, you know, maybe some of those members on that team are, are kind of getting older or phasing out or have moved at, around that time. And your son or daughter or loved one has different needs. And so you kind of need to remake that circle. And that's a lot of work for the caregivers, for the parents, for the families. Um, so to have you know the help through step uh, especially you know in the medical i can see how it's you have almost an intimate relationship with your doctors there mm -hmm. um, and you've built that relationship uh, as a child and as a family together with them you feel like you can rely on them it's been 17 18 21 years with the same doctors mm -hmm. um, and so you're worried about that next step you know this doctor is not going to know my not going to know myself not going to know my family member so we're going to have to go through this all again don't underestimate the impact of retelling your whole healthcare journey. That is a lot for families to have to redo basically 18 years potentially of medical dramas in one quick setting. And the beauty of stuff is you're not in and out the door with a 15 minute billing appointment. Your time is yours. Our time is yours for that clinic because you have opportunities to spend time with really caring providers and then you get your social work support. And then there is the preparation on the front end mm -hmm. where because there is the foot in both world um, so that all of their medical records from children's beforehand have been uploaded into the adult system and mm -hmm. so they're not having to retell all of that information um, and the whole concept of step is really centered on what we call the ITP concept or individualized transition plan um, and really what that means is that every family is coming into this process at different stages and with a different set of needs and so it has to be very individualized to them what transition is going to look like what community resources they're going to need Need, what the support that they're going to need to make it into that um, next step. There are some patients who um, we you know, know are going to be totally making their own decisions and they can you know, have um, minimal support and they're able to make that smooth transition into the adult system. There's other families who need to have a couple of years where they're continued to be seen by both pediatric and adult providers in order to make that transition over. Um, it kind of sounds like you would bring in, it's bringing in both doctors into the room over a number of years, uh, shaking hands and discussing information there to, to help that transition to the next doctor. Um, and that also sounds like it's quite a bit of time um, in, for the families to come into the STEP program, but also for uh, the people of STEP uh, to spend there. So how many uh, people are involved with STEP? Yeah, so... That's a little difficult to answer at this point because there's so many. I've been completely overwhelmed by this support on both the pediatric and adult side. And there's been many groups that have tried to work on transition within the health system for years leading up to STEP. And for whatever reason, it feels like the timing and this program are just the right fit. Um, we've had the you know, for each diagnosis, and the way that we've really tried to approach this is by discipline or um, with even within a discipline by diagnosis. And so we've been able to bring the pediatric providers to the table and identify what we call transition physician champions on the pediatric side, and then match those with an adult physician champion where we could say, what's this going to look like for this specific patient population? So that by the time the patient's actually in front of us, we've already had those discussions and we can say this is our well thought out plan which avoids families from really feeling like they've graduated to the cliff's edge and it's like good luck hope, hope you make it yeah. you know you can tell that there's been all of these conversations and plans in place ahead of time and that we were prepared for them to make this next step that's reassuring coming into that meeting you know, if right. the physicians and the people involved are like, oh, hey, you know, we know this is going on or, you know, might, you might have trouble here. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the eligibility into the STEP program. Now, it says 
uh, chronic and complex childhood medical conditions. If, if you would kind of elaborate on sure. what that looks like. So maybe if an individual or family member is watching, they're wondering if they could get into the STEP program. So we've intentionally kept the definition quite broad on any patient that has any complex condition of childhood can be seen in STEP. And again, it's important to think about the STEP program as having these two arms that I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, our first you know, piece that we worked on was developing the STEP clinic at UAP. And the reason that we started there is because no matter how ready a patient is for transition, if you haven't identified a landing zone for them, then all the preparation is you know, kind of for nothing. And so the first thing that we worked on was having that landing zone. So the clinic that meets at UAB is a medical home that is um, ran by two primary care physicians. And that in, in that space, in that clinic space, the patients coming in and, and like Jenny you know, kind of talked about, they're coming in and we're identifying the specialists that they're going to need and kind of holding all those pieces together. Within the second piece of that is the work that's happening at Children's Hospital. And so what we're working on is kind of this grassroots effort to infuse transition readiness planning into every clinic across Children's Hospital. So regardless of whether a patient is going to eventually be seen in the STEP clinic, they should in some way be impacted by the work of the STEP program because it's that work that should be happening in all of the clinics um, you know, over the next several years that work is being infused into the clinics. Yeah, uh, and it, it makes sense if you think about other people uh, or everybody transitioning uh, through that stage of life. Uh, I remember in, in high school, it was like, you know, what does that look like? Are you gonna go on to continue your education? Are you gonna continue to compete in a sport? Mm -hmm. And there were a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of help for that for me if I, had, if I wanted to go get it and talk to people. And so to be able to provide that on a different length for individuals that have these um, chronic health care needs or extra, you know, they need extra help in families there, it's like another wave of support there for them. Right. So. Yeah, I always tell this story about when my daughter left for college and she went to the doctor for the first time and called me and was like, Mom, what am I allergic to? And I'm like, oh my gosh, how can I be <laughs> in charge of transition and my child doesn't know what she's allergic to? So for some kids, it's just as simple as, what are you allergic to? Mm -hmm. What medications are you on? What do you do in the event that you, know, you have a healthcare emergency? And your health team really needs to be part of that and part of that planning for that. For other families, they really find a better fit in also being seen in the STEP clinic because there are a lot of complex conditions going on and they are going to have a lot of specialists and having that additional care coordination and, and support that can hold all those pieces together um, is really helpful for families. Um, speaking about uh, speaking with our moms uh, about medical conditions, I think my mom called me in my first year at college and she was like, you know, you can't just go to the ER for everything, right? <laughs> it's like there's a copay on this. That too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So That's like, part of our planning. <laughs> I don't really know about that, mom. What am I supposed to do? She's like, call the doctor. Go to the doctor. I'm like, okay. Um, so what is the age group um, that the STEP program serves? Yeah, so again, going back to that concept of ITP or Individualized Transition Plan, so with every patient, it can look a little different, and, and even with some of the adult providers and pediatric providers for different conditions, it looks different. Um, we will start taking patients at age 18, um, and then for some of those patients, that looks like them being seen with us beginning at eight age 18, but then they keep their specialist at Children's Hospital until 20 or 21, um, and we spend those first three years getting them plugged into adult providers. Um, for other patients, they come over at 18, 19, and we immediately get them plugged in with adult providers, and so it really is just individualized with each patient and what they're comfortable with and what their pediatric physician's comfortable with as well. But we, just, oh, go ahead, I'm we sorry. Do, we do recommend for CRS patients um, specifically that we maintain the the, the two paths until 21. Um, we don't want to lose some of the CRS supports that occur and so we will try to transition just the primary care when a family is ready for primary care but hold off on the specialist until 21. STEP also does have a physical therapist who's been involved and so some of the equipment needs for our kids who have mobility issues can get picked up but we try not to do that until they've maximized all of the services available through the state program mm -hmm. and then we get them over to step is that then uh the last year there if there are those extra specialists that need to be is it kind of 
a lot of work in the last year for those individuals? So we're so new, we only launched in September, so we haven't quite made it through too many kids to that point yet, young people to that point yet, but that would be the goal. The idea would be that you'd start at step at 18 with just primary care transitioning and your CRS worker will help you kind of move your specialist over by the time you're 21, you're fully enrolled with your adult specialist at UAB and you're really prepared to exit. And that last appointment at a CRS clinic is just a, a you know, a, a goodbye and we're so excited for your next stage. Here's exactly where you're gonna be. You already know this person. Um, I have a question. We were talking about the age. Is there a, an age that the son or daughter or individual has to exhibit those complex medical conditions? Yeah, so yeah, because there hasn't been a program like this in the past, we have some individuals that are in their 30s that are new patients with us in the okay. step clinic because they unfortunately are still struggling with the things that if they would have had a transition program that those gaps wouldn't exist. Um, and and we also don't have an age cutoff for like we're gonna see you until this certain point and then we're gonna transition you out of the step clinic. The really nice thing is because we are a primary care medical home, we can keep those patients, you know, as long as as long as, you know, that service is needed. And so for many of our complex patients, they're not gonna necessarily be able to find primary care in their community that have enough experience with their condition for them to feel comfortable with transitioning out of step. And so for those patients, they would just continue to be seen with us. Were you asking more about like age of onset of condition? Both, so we did a broadcast with uh, Alabama ABLE accounts, yes. which is for the, the savings mm -hmm. um, with Anita Kelly and um, uh, State Treasurer McMillan. Mm -hmm. And uh, during that, I think you, you had to show some of the complex mental needs by 26. Uh, there are different programs utilize different cutoffs. Um, I, I know you all have talked to Department of Mental Health and they utilize 18. Um, I don't know that we've ever formalized anything, but I think if you've received childhood care for the condition, mm -hmm. so we, we would assume you're, you're probably under 18 before your condition presents, um, you would most likely be eligible, probably more likely for childhood cancers and maybe diabetes, and we see those, those patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was asking. Yeah. If if something happened in uh, you know, yeah. I was in a or car a TBI. Yeah. 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 If, if I was in a car crash at 34, would mm -hmm. I still be eligible? You probably would be able to tap straight into adult care um, because you're not. Be I think mainly it's it's for families who who've utilized pediatric systems and are having to switch. Yeah. Um, but if you had a car crash at 18, you'd be in I that think position. You'd be right. more yeah. Likely. And you know the thing that. Pediatric health care does so well, and especially when you combine that with CRS, is the care coordination piece. And so those families have really grown accustomed to having a care network mm -hmm. and people who are holding all of their health care together. And so while that's very much a positive, if the patient then turns 21 and all that care coordination is just turned off, then, you know, it... You, it makes sense why you see such a decline in health outcomes in that population. So that's really the primary thing that we're trying to avoid. Um, that makes total sense. So if, if someone was older and did have TBI, they are already onto the adult healthcare Correct. system. Exactly. So right. that would be more appropriate for them. But you did mention that there are some 30 year olds that maybe are still receiving pediatric care or, or, or right. younger or level never and they, they yeah. never transitioned. Correct. So they would still be eligible. Absolutely. Correct. So anyone out there that's thinking this program is only for teenagers or young adults, right. uh, if you haven't received those transition services, please contact the STEP absolutely. program. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And certainly if you're still following with any pediatric specialist and that adult um, counterpart for that particular specialist hasn't been identified, then the STEP would be a perfect place to help you make those connections. Mm -hmm. And we've had that happen. We've had plenty absolutely. of families come who, who didn't quite ever make a full health care transition because there really wasn't an option at the time and they've come back in and it's been you know clients that were that we had known for years that children's hospital had known for years that just kind of we, we lost for a minute and now we get to see these families again and it's been wonderful yeah that, a that's great a example to you is patients with neuromuscular conditions oh, yes. i was told when i started working with transition that any patient with a neuromuscular condition not that 
I, that would be the group that I would not be able to transition and that, that would be the most complicated. And so I kind of heard that and took it as a challenge of you now you've got to go solve transition for neuromuscular. Um, and so we did. We found a young faculty that is amazing and has agreed to partner with us. We now do a neuromuscular transition clinic on um, once a quarter and we are beginning um, with those 30 year olds who had never transitioned and we're folding them into the step clinic and really being able to meet all of those other adult-like conditions that couldn't be met on in the pediatric facility. I'm sure they're very grateful that they kind of been, I don't want to say wandering around, but they just could have used that extra bit of support there uh, to make that jump, make that leap. Um, what percentage do you think are those individuals that are a little bit older that are kind of coming back for those transition services as opposed to those that are kind of naturally aging into it? Yeah, I would say that about 70% are in the 18 to 23 category, um, which you would consider the you know, typical age um, for a transition program. But I would say there's a solid 30% who are older than that um, who are being folded into the clinic. And, and many of them, it's just kind of a word of mouth thing. Um, you know, there's very few clinics that I leave and I'm not um, almost in tears when I leave because of hearing the heartwarming stories from families of just how grateful they are to have a program like this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be praised more and more as, as it gets more exposure and more individuals go through the program. Exactly. Uh, hope. <laughs> speaking of, we have uh, a special guest with us, us here today. I'm going to take a step back. And <laughs> Everybody, I'd like to welcome Mrs. Tammy Moore to the broadcast today. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people know Mrs. Moore. She's been a part of Alabama Care from the very beginning, uh, almost two and a half years ago. Really? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's 2018. I think it was uh, October 2018. So we're coming right up on it. Um, and we have the absolute pleasure of having you here today. We are in your office location. If you would just give us a in quick introduction. Okay, well, I'm Tammy Moore. I'm the parent consultant here at Children's Rehab. And I'm, I'm a mommy. I have two um, young adult, mid to late 30s sons. See, I'm getting old, Betsy. <laughs> and then I have Kelsey, and she's 27. She'll be 28 in um, September and she has a very rare syndrome so kind of been there and done that I say all the time to parents our children may have you know different diagnosis they be very different in many many ways but then we share the same paths in many many ways too so even though my daughter is a rare bird we um, have a lot in common um, and uh We've met Kelsey on the broadcast before, either through uh, the Full Life Ahead camp. Uh, so people are familiar with Kelsey's watch. She's always in the chat. Oh, uh, yeah. And you can just pull that thing closer to you. Okay. Yeah. I'm very soft-spoken. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now your family has a, a direct experience with this STEP program. Is that correct? Yes, we do. And um, I cannot say enough about STEP, Betsy, and... Jenny, I just really can't. It's wonderful. I just told you guys that Kelsey's 27 now, and so we came to that cliff. You know, you know, like mm -hmm. when you go, your child goes through early intervention, and there are three, and there's like, oh, what are we going to do? And mm -hmm. you know, you go through all those transitions through school. There's like Betsy was saying earlier. There's so many transitions in life, but when you hit 21 or 18, you might be a little earlier, and you have a child who has all of these very complex medical conditions and requires all these specialists, um, all this specialty care, you're, you're, you're looking down and there's nothing. Um, there, especially in Kelsey's situation, there was no one, no specialist, really adult providers who knew anything about this syndrome. And I think we'll find that out with those that even have things that are more common like cerebral palsy. They don't know how to take care of these young adults. And so um, we didn't come to step until, when was it, Betsy? We were like one yeah, of the first. Like one of, the, one of, the, one of yeah. the first. Yeah, but even though we arrived there late, 
you continue to transition through life. And we had gone through some specialty providers and still have some of those, but things change. They constantly, you're constantly transitioning. Kelsey's needs changed and, and they led us to providers that we needed and that I was having trouble finding. And I've, you know, I've been blessed to be here as a parent consultant and have um, knowledge, access, and connections to folks, but none of us know it all. And it, it really takes a village. And, and I really, I think STEP is the best thing since lost bread. If, <laughs> if it would have been such a blessing, such a blessing if we had had that access, if STEP had been here when Kelsey was in that beginning of transitioning mm -hmm. into adult care. You know, you just imagine yourself falling off that cliff. But if you, now there's step, and you could just step into transition other than that, taking that fall, which seems, you know, so scary. So Kelsey's uh, actually was a little bit older than what we were talking about, is naturally aging into that step program. Right. Um, so she went back and did that transition. And she, and you guys found out that she was looking for providers, more specific providers you were having trouble finding. Yes. And, and the STEP program there really helped you identify who those were and introduce those those providers to your family and to Kelsey. Yes, very much so. I don't know. Um, it's so hard to find. I hate to say people who get it, who people who have those, that experience of working with individuals who have not only complex medical needs, but perhaps intellectual disabilities. And there's so many things to consider. Um, in that care, this the demographics. There's, we're all people. We're all different. Have so many different needs, but step really gets it, and they've been there and done that, and so it's just a natural place to go. Um, what would you say to an individual or a family looking to get involved in the step, or maybe uh, their child or daughter, and or they are a little bit older, and thinking about going back into the transition? Oh, don't think twice. Y'all have got the phone number, you're going to fit on the screen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we will. We'll put I it mean, in chat. Yeah, yeah I God. mean, yeah, I would love to see them overwhelmed, but then I would hate it for them <laughs> too. But it is such a wonderful, wonderful thing. It's a blessing. And it's been great for our family okay. and for Kelsey. And she loves it too. And she gets to see you guys. You know. I love Kelsey. I love her too. Um, thank you. Yeah, Mrs. Moore, we appreciate you being here with us thank today. I know you said you me and thank you all for all your hard work that you do with staff. I really appreciate it. And so does Kelsey Dan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm looking for her in chat right now. I'm like, I wonder if she's watching right now. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't tell her. It was kind of last minute. So yeah. <laughs> she'll watch the recording. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, once again, thank you for being here with thank us. Thank you. And we appreciate you sharing the story. And um, we're not going to hold you up too long. I know you're here at no. work. So. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I appreciate you having me in. And y'all um, put the number up, okay? <laughs> you guys call. Heck yeah. Okay, I'm going to stand up and just reposition your camera once again here. Um, so I thought that was really cool. We were here um, at Children's Rehabilitation Services and kind of taking a tour ahead of time and Tammy Moore, longtime friend. And I was like, Tammy, you know, it's good to see you. And she's like, oh, we've done the STEP program. She's like, do you want me to step in? And then she immediately goes, I don't want to step in. I'm like, oh, you're definitely <laughs> stepping in. Uh, it's so, just so important to hear that, though, because we need to hear it because it sometimes we need to hear those yeah. things. It makes us feel good about what we're doing. But it means it's working because no one wants to implement another program that may not be effective. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that somebody, and I've heard this from other families that I work with, that they really do feel like, oh my gosh, it's finally the thing we've been so afraid of isn't as scary. And so it's just so nice to be able to hear it from well, someone like Tammy. And kind of what she talked about really is a nice segue into that whole ITP concept because really what we're trying to do with that, it becomes the framework for the transition process. Mm -hmm. And so in the, in the ITP, each family receives five goals. And so on the first goal, what we're focusing on is referrals. And so what we're really thinking about is because we are a primary care medical home, there's some specialists that individuals may have had in childhood that may not be necessary if they have a good primary care who understands lots of, of complex conditions. And so we're identifying where can we consolidate care because let's be honest, these families, you know, 
transportation often is an issue. There's a lot of equipment to move around. There's a lot, you know, lots of moving pieces to get them to healthcare. So how can we kind of make healthcare come to them when possible? Then we look for what specialists do most of our patients need? Is there a way that we can bring those specialists to the step clinic? So um, on the third Wednesday of every month, we have a clinic where we have rehab medicine and neurology come and join us for clinic. So a patient can come in and see their primary care doctor and also have their epilepsy managed and um, see rehabilitation medicine all in one space. Um, the you know, final piece to that is you know, what referrals are they going to need that we may not have a provider in the step clinic space, but we can make those connections for them and we can smooth that path for them. And, and so we're really looking at all of those pieces as that first goal. And again, and, and like Tammy said, every patient's going to come into that with individual needs and, and you know, what care they need is going to look different than the next patient. Um, for the second goal, we're really focusing on, um, you know, we see two types of patients typically. We see some patients that are totally caregiver dependent and they may be nonverbal. Um, and so for those patients, we're really focused on family unit support. And so how can we provide support to the caregiver? How can we think about advanced care planning? Um, and then there are patients who we, you know, with um, some community support and with, you know, some support from the health system, will be able to take over their own health care. And so um, for those patients, we're focusing on career and education and community resources um, and, and giving them a goal based on that. Um, for the third piece, we're looking specifically at their transition readiness assessment. Um, and then on the fourth, we're um, asking you know, for a parent or self goal. Um, and those are kind of some funny stories. Um, you know, I'll say to a mom or dad, when you think about your you know, um, son or daughter living by themselves one day, what scares you? And I hear things like, oh my gosh, they don't know how to cook, or they you know, are really messy, or they don't brush their teeth without being told. <laughs> and so they get a goal that's specific to whatever that thing is that the parents have identified. And then for their fifth goal, we're setting an emergency and a sick plan. I always kind of say that it's a transition fail if a person comes and is established in the adult system, but then as soon as they have kind of an acute health need, they go back to the children's ER because that's where they're most comfortable. And so we try to identify what are those fears on the front end. And so then those five pieces make up that ITP for each family. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to create that ITP for the individual and the family? Is it, and what does it look like? Is it sitting down one on one uh, in a room, or is it more emails back and forth over the course of a month or two? Yeah, go ahead. So typically, that's where your social worker will come into play, um, and so we we get feedback from the physicians if they've seen the the patient first. Ideally, they'll give us some areas that they'd like us to focus on. We get the transition readiness assessment or the caregiver burden index, depending on the appropriateness for the person and look at that a little bit ahead of time. And then we sit down and we, within that clinic appointment, take that time to talk with them about what their goals are, how to write the goals. And then when they return, we wanna review that and say, well, hey, how did we do on some of these? Have we made some progress forward? Have we made some movement on some of these goals? Um, it's important though that they are really individualized and they take the time they need. So for some families, these goals are gonna take five minutes to come up with. They really have a pretty good idea of where they wanna be. For some families, we talk for an hour. Um, it, it really is about meeting a family where they are, where they are in the process, and what they need to move forward. Mm -hmm. And I like, uh, it sounds like there's a lot of moving parts that go on before that meeting even happens, like Absolutely. contacting the doctors, having all that background mm -hmm. information to kind of start compiling that and meet the families so that, like you said, you're not walking into a cold room where you have mm -hmm. to start over again, talking about 18 years right. of medical care and goals and stuff like that. And for some families, it does feel good to explain the past. They, they need that and they need that time to do that too. And that's okay as well. It is okay to walk people back through what you've experienced and we're fine Absolutely. with that. And we want to give people the opportunity to do that if that's what they want but we never want to come into a room and say okay why are you here yeah no, that's a turn off uh, well, just walk out happen, the door and it happens all the time and so the goal is to never have that experience in step clinic where someone's like what what's happening like what are you even doing here and so that's really what we're hoping with the ITP planning is that we've done some of the front end work we've built the beginnings of the plan and then we solidify it and all collectively agree on it 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of the ways that I always introduce the ITP to a family or, you know, especially to the individual is this is a contract between me and you. So if I say a goal and you don't want to do it, it's something like, you know, going into this, that you're not going to shower seven days a week. And that's what we're writing yeah, down. Yeah. Then let's don't write that down. Let's pick something that you will agree to that is important to you, too. And then I like that on the ITP, we also put the person responsible because in some cases, the person responsible is going to be Jenny because she's going to have information about the community resource and she's going to get them plugged into that or she's going to be mailing them resources. She's going to be reaching out to their voc rehab counselor. Um, in some cases, the person responsible is going to be their physician because their physician is going to be reaching out to their specialist. And so the family can see that this isn't just a list of, list of tasks that we're giving them. Mm-hmm. It's we're all circling around and together and we all have tasks to get this person ready. A little bit of uh, accountability there. So it's not just kind of floating there. It's moving along to the Correct. next step. That's the goal, yeah. We would yeah. want it to progress over time and to mark goals off as completed as we move to the next. That, that's a lot of pro- project management as well. <laughs> like almost using a slack, like, okay, you're up. I'm tagging <laughs> right. you. You know, you have to check mark that, that yeah. this is going through. Um, now, in doing a little bit of background research on the STEP program, I saw that there were two initiatives, and you talked about this a little bit, um, the transition planning and then the primary care clinic, and those being the Children's of Alabama and UAB. And if you could just, you know, explain that just sure. very shortly, really quick. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like I said, you know, our first step was to um, establish that landing zone for patients, and we felt like we sh- could do that best with a primary care medical home that was staffed by med MedPeds trained physicians, and that was really important to us on the front end. Um, transition is very important to all MedPeds trained physicians, but we actually found two that are extremely passionate about it and that we feel very fortunate to have. Um, but the second piece of that is making sure that we're doing everything early enough in the process that we're giving patients the best opportunity to be ready for transition. All of the literature around transition really says that you should start by at least by age 14 in discussing what's going to be happening, what's gonna, what what's coming up, and the whole ITP concept should really start at age 14. That doesn't mean they're going to leave the children's hospital at that time, but that does mean that the patient should become comfortable with talking to their doctors, with answering questions, with knowing their physician's phone numbers, with being able to articulate what medications they're on and what their um, health care condition is. Um, you know, kind of the saddest thing to me is when you walk into a patient room and, and you've got a 14 or 15 year old and you say, you know, how do you feel today? And they quickly turn their head and look at their mom. Well, you're mom doesn't know how you feel today you know how you feel today um and so just you know infusing that whole idea of transition readiness much earlier and so that's the work that's happening at children's hospital we've put together a working group and there's a physician champion from pretty much every discipline at children's that's part of this working group this group is up to 55 people now um, which kind of again speaks to um, just how interested and how overwhelmed I've been with the support that we've gotten from physicians across both health systems. Um, But these physician champions are coming to the table and saying, okay, um, these are the things that should be discussed in a transition visit. This is what we're already doing and these are the pieces that we could add currently to, you know, with the resources we have, this is what we could add. And so what we're asking clinics to do and we're in kind of this pilot period of building this at Children's of Alabama right now. And what we're asking physicians to do is to agree to do a transition readiness assessment questionnaire. And that's track for short, um, but that's a validated tool that looks at transition readiness. So we're asking them to do that on their patients. And then also to use the transition note, um, which is a note that I worked with IT on um, and, and have in the children's records so that when a pediatric physician fills out that note and signs it, it automatically goes to UAB, which is kind of a huge deal um, to to kind of be able to share those health records. Mm -hmm. So that's the work happening at Children's and then the clinic um, and defining the metrics and making sure that we have the space and the um, support from physicians and um, and the ability to you know sustain this program and grow this program is the work happening at UAB. 
Uh, I'm going to comment really quick on uh, being in the doctor's office. I feel like I go to the doctor's office and I'm like, oh, my knee hurts or oh, my shoulder hurts. And I get in the doctor's office and he's like, how's it? And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we're fine. Oh, <laughs> I do man. that all the time. You and every other kid I work with. <laughs> yeah. And then on the way out, I'm like, oh, yeah, I got a little. Yeah. He's like, just ice it, ibuprofen, you're yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> I've noticed as I get older, that's kind of what the doctor says more and more. Yeah. Just put ice on it and take yeah. some ibuprofen. That's part of track. Um, so part of what she's talking about when she's talking about track is learning how to actually talk a little bit to your doctor. Mm -hmm. Like starting that at age 14, where by the time we're you know, adults, we actually know what we're expected to do in those appointments and what's kind of expected of us as consumers of healthcare. And so to some extent, that transition readiness assessment is that primer that is teaching our young people what they're gonna have to do once mom and dad aren't there anymore. And we, we know that for some of our, our patients, um, mom and dad are always going to be there. And that's part of, part of track two. We, we recognize the idea that supported decision making may be part of some of our family's um, long-term plan. And so we want to respect and work with that as well. So I don't want anyone to get the sense that that, if it's you couldn't do it yourself, right. yeah. And if you're a young person who's not going to be able to do your own transition readiness assessment, that we wouldn't want you as part of our group and that you're not absolutely as important as anyone else. Well, I think a lot of the, the families could benefit from hearing that too, because even if, mm -hmm. you know, I, I have a family member that has a caregiving team mm -hmm. and there are times when I'm not at the doctor's office with them. So I'm, we're very fortunate that someone has been with my family member, my aunt for 15 years as a caregiver, you know, they're, they're like family mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. does a lot of the doctor's appointments, but she is able to speak up on her behalf mm -hmm. and training, um, you know, maybe that caregiving staff, how to do that from the families because they've received training from Step or even just starting to identify who that's going to be. Yeah. You know, because when your child is, is 12 and 14, you still probably haven't wrapped your head around the idea that that may not be you forever. Um, but as they get to 18, 20, 21 and start to see us in step clinic, we're really ready to have that fuller conversation about, okay, now if it isn't going to be you, how do we start to have that broader circle and have those bigger conversations? Mm -hmm. And that's really where I feel like the track helps not only the healthcare team and the providers, but also the parents mm -hmm. because the assessment is basically, you know, a five point scale of yes, I always do this to no, I never do this to the middle being no, I don't do this, but I'd like to learn. Mm -hmm. So you can actually take that assessment and do, you know, a motivational interview. So, okay, you said you don't know how to talk to your doctors, but that you'd like to learn. Well, let me help you with that. So let's pull out the notes section on your phone. And between now and when you see me next time, I want you to write five things on your notes section that you notice about your body that you want to make sure to tell your doctor. And the next visit, all we're going to do is get out that notes section. You're not going to have to say anything. All we're going to do is get out that notes section. And then maybe the what would build on top of that the next time is, okay, now you're going to do that in your notes section, but then you're also going to tell me what you've written down, you're gonna describe those things to me. And so it's a building process, but families can also see that my child says they don't know how to do this, but they'd like to learn. And so that's a place where we can partner with them on, well, let me teach you how to do that. Mm -hmm. now, I like how you guys are starting with the goals. Uh, now for my family member, she's 56 about to be 57 and she has our person center planning every year where she goes over the goals that she has for the next 12 months and from that then she designs and we help her design what her daily weekly monthly schedule looks like so sitting down and getting those goals from the individual and the family is really where it all starts um, to help them progress through that right and it sounds like a lot of baby steps there and we're just going to take this one step at a right. time and for some people you know, my family member's goals might take her a year to achieve, where for others, they'd achieve it in a week. Um, so it's really individualized on, well, we're going to take these in baby steps. If you have, you know, we'll come back, we'll read the notes. And if we struggle with that, we'll come back next week and we'll try it again. Yeah. And the other you know piece of this, when I first started this concept with spina bifida, I would see, you know, where I'd set these goals. And sometimes I may see the family next year and would say, you know, how's this thing going? And they'd be like, we set that goal, I don't really remember that. But then I would give them another track and the track is scored. And so it's scoring how ready they are. And what I would see is that they were vastly improved in their readiness from the last discussion to this discussion. So sometimes, and, and what I'd love to encourage families, sometimes just by opening the dialogue and having these discussions, you are improving readiness, even if that specific goal may not be being met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, I don't see my fingernails grow, but if I didn't cut them,
them for a week, you'd notice a big right. difference. Mm -hmm. uh, so seeing that over time there. Uh, and I also want to comment on starting at the UAB because I think that was a really cool idea there in that landing. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would almost be like taking off in a plane and having a flight path and knowing where you want to go, but not having a landing right, strip exactly. to land That's on. That's what was happening before. Yeah. It so really to was. be able to identify that final destination, mm -hmm. have a physical location of what that looks like, I think helps it would help me take off right mm -hmm. it would be very hard for me to take off in a play if and I that's didn't know exactly where I was what was and happening people weren't and that's what was happening we, we weren't um and and it's still that fear is still there this is really new um it's only been going since august september september mm -hmm. there's still that fear and it's still there that i have been held tight and well and children some doctors will keep seeing me a little longer and i'm going to push that i'm going to see how long i can stay because i don't want to go to that new place but maybe the more that we share that this new place actually is going to give you that true person-centered care, the more willing we'll have for families to actually get on that plane. Well, we want uh, families to be knocking down the door like, hey, I'm done seeing the old provider. We're, yeah. we're ready. Let's, let's do this hope. thing. And it's funny, you see like two groups of patients, almost no in between, but you see some you know, patients who are like, I'm sick of going to the doctor yeah. and seeing Mickey Mouse on the wall. Like, I'm not a kid anymore. <laughs> I want to go to an adult. And then you see the ones that are like, please don't ever make me leave the children's hospital. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, again, that whole concept of it has to be individualized. You have to meet families where they are. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, you have to be able to create a system where they can receive equal or better care than what they've currently been receiving. Exactly. And that's the key to all of it is as long as they can have the confidence that I'm going to receive equal or better care. Yeah, I may love that pediatric doctor, but it may not be safe for me to be seen in a pediatric hospital anymore because now I'm going to have adult conditions that they're just not used to taking care of. Yeah. And it's like that <laughs> pediatric doctor might be the best doctor in pediatrics, but right. you're getting older, your child's right, getting right. older, so they have different needs. Right. And that's not always the best setup. Exactly. Um, speaking of the doctors and providers that they're going to be seeing when they enter the STEP program for adult health care and then mm -hmm. after, um, you mentioned that not all providers are proficient in complex medical needs. How do you find the right doctors and how do you onboard them to the program? Yeah, so part of our you know initial plan was to you know really partner with MedPeds, and that was I think a critical um, and and really important first um, step that that we did um, and then we were able to reach out specifically to to each of the specialists and so at this point um, we're very fortunate in Carly Stein being our medical director of the STEP program she's also the director of the residency program for MedPeds and so people are constantly telling her when they have interest in doing transition work and and I think we'll be able to continue to sustain and grow this program um, through physicians that are coming up and training with her. Um, and you know, regarding specialists, it is a two-part, you know, kind of this two-way education that has to happen between pediatric and adult specialists. Um, adult specialists are willing to take these patients when they're not coming in emergently through the ED and in these kind of you know, horrible states after they've been out without care for 10 years. Um, the specialists were actually very willing to learn what they needed to learn and take over care when they were coming in through the front door of primary care instead of the ED in this critical acute state as a 40 year old who didn't transition properly. Yeah, now that you mention it like that, I imagine the specialists are pretty eager to get on Correct. board with STEP. It makes it a, a better transition for them. Um, and you know they can help that individual for a longer uh, course. Because many of these patients were ending up at UAB eventually anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. just not in the way that anybody would want them exactly. to, to end Coming up Coming in there. on the last straw where it needs right. to be mm -hmm. done right well, away. We so much care. Right. Yeah, and stay, probably staying longer. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, coming in, you know, needing multiple surgeries, mm -hmm. you know, long length of stays in the hospital, um, multiple readmissions after that long length of stay, um, you know, just a situation that is not beneficial, certainly for the patient, that's what matters most, but also for the health system. And, and that wears on you mentally. Um, mm -hmm. Now, my grandfather passed away about two years ago, and we were in and out of the hospital at St. Vincent's for couple months mm -hmm. and I could just tell that it was wearing on him looking mm -hmm. at the hospital lights day in and day out and unsure and wanted to go home and mm -hmm. um, so to get these checkups a little bit more readily will help you from spending a significant amount of time in the hospital that, that's that's what the data says yeah yep. yeah and by having that care coordination piece you know I think the biggest 
<clears throat> one of the biggest benefits that STEP provides is that patients have that easy point of contact. Mm -hmm. So they're not having to wait until, you know, they're sitting home with their sick loved one and then it has to get so bad and now I've got to go to the emergency department. They're calling on day one of, hey, this is what I'm seeing, what should I do? So we're able to meet that need, usually over the phone. Um, and we've actually, through COVID, used telemedicine a lot as well, mm -hmm. um, which has been really great. But we're able to meet that need early on, which prevents a lot of um, those down stream things from happening. The emergencies from coming about. Now you guys, the STEP program has been up and running since September. Correct. Um, so what are we at there? Nine months, something like that. What is something that you've both learned through this process of the STEP program coming about? Mrs. Yeah, Hobson, there's been so much that I've really learned and appreciated through this process. But again, going back to that idea of care coordination has been probably the biggest lesson and the one that I like to talk about the most because I think it's really unfair to families. I think that the Children's Hospital does such a fantastic job of a lot of times the families don't even know all of the effort that's going in to the care coordination that's happening. Um, you know, and I'll use my patients with spina bifida as an example. My families never call and make an appointment. I meet with all of their care team. I, de you know, decide what would be an appointment that would save them from making multiple trips. I make sure that the tests are happening, that there's no duplication of tests, that when they get to the hospital, that they literally come, or to the clinic visit, that they literally come in and everything's been scheduled and done for them. Any community, you know, outreach they need, all of that's been done and, and set up for them. Um, and that's great and it's really important. But then for the patients to reach 21 and then to all of a sudden say, well, you're losing your CRS um, support because all of the things I'm doing for care coordination at Children's of Alabama, most of my families are also getting in their community from CRS. And so then you add another layer of care coordination and then all of a sudden they become an adult. And to think that all of a sudden that care coordination need stops is, you know, um, one of the biggest lessons is that that's really unfair to families to not have them continue to have a place that holds everything together and that's a point of contact for them. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to say that. I've just learned so much about the adult health care system. Mm -hmm. We are strictly pediatric, really. Even though we work transition, we prepare for transition, we still very much live in that pediatric world. And so us having the opportunity to go to UAB, to meet with Betsy, to meet Carly, to meet Madeline, to meet these physicians who are going to pick up this care long term has been an amazing experience. And it's also wonderful to be able to watch multiple physicians in one room discuss one patient because we don't get to see that a lot. Even in a place like Children's, there are still um, siloed care because of the nature of medical care. And STEP has allowed multiple specialists to sit in a room together and talk about one person and their care needs within a time that doesn't feel rushed. Social work is involved and can be pulled in as needed. And it feels like it's giving the real care that we want for our transitioning young adults and suddenly there it is and we get to be part of it and it's been amazing as someone who's done transition for years without step to now do transition with step it, it's changed how we work here mm. so there's residual benefits for <clears throat> you know, the step program up and running but the people that it's educating and teaching is kind of trickling out throughout the community uh, and down into the individuals and the families there. and it really is having just kind of that whole grassroots effect where the more we talk about it and the more people that are involved, the more people are really excited to be involved. And so um, there are specialists now who, you know, I, I think probably are considered transition experts who would never identify themselves that way, but have become that because um, the passion for this, you know, this work is just kind of igniting and you see it on both the pediatric and adult side people at children's are so excited to get behind what we're doing people at uab are really excited and most importantly the two institutions are working together in a way that the families are benefiting from yeah I, the conversation today i imagine is just a red carpet treatment uh and i believe that you know people are going to be knocking on the door uh just kind of flustered with with the way things are going and like hey okay we're ready for this mm -hmm. now let's let's but jump the goal on board would be that that eventually doesn't become anyone's idea of red carpet treatment that becomes everyone's idea of appropriate health care mm. because i think that's what appropriate health care probably should be um and so that's what we hope is that we'll sort of break down that idea that having all of your providers talk to each other or 
having 30 minutes with a social worker doesn't become this like extra special thing. It's just what you would expect from a visit. Yeah. And I think Alabama uh, is kind of leading in some of those areas. Mm -hmm. And it's I exciting. So. Actually, yeah. uh, and I always go Southern hospitality kind of thing. But I think uh, we're going to, I don't know if we are already, but we're recognized nationally um, mm -hmm. as leaders for, um, you know, that kind of the healthcare. Uh, so. And I do want our families to feel like they are being concierge through the system because the one, you know, truth that I come back to is that um, these individuals and the families who are taking care of them, you know, they, they are holding a lot together and every single day, you know, there, there are things with their health care condition that they're having to overcome and that they're having to take care of accessing care shouldn't be hard. Yeah. Yeah, there's things in their life that are hard, but accessing their health care shouldn't yeah. be. Our mm -hmm. patients don't exist in the bubble where everything else around them is perfect, and then it's just their needs. There are so many multiple levels of need with the people we see at STEP, and so the fact that we can recognize those multiple levels and not just say, oh, you're kicked out of care because you missed appointments because you were at the ER for somebody else, that can happen. You can lose care because of things that are not of your own fault and we're able to kind of take that into consideration and say okay well let's just get you rescheduled as soon as we can and see what we can do to help that's amazing it's an amazing service that you guys are providing now how many individuals or families are currently served through the step program yeah so at uab in the step clinic we have 170 patients um, that are um, being seen and then we're adding new patients every week the clinic meets um, Wednesday morning of every week and and you know every single week we're adding you know four to eight new patients um, and um, and then on the children's side it's kind of a little more difficult to quantify how many patients are are going to be receiving those tracks earlier and um, that counseling with their physicians earlier on preparing for transition um, but we do have that um, step working group and we are rolling out with type 1 diabetes IBD um, patients with hydrocephalus and um, patients in adolescent medicine are going to be the first groups rolling out um, utilizing that ITP concept earlier in the clinics at Children's. Uh, 170 is quite a bit in the first few months and then four to eight a week is is massive right uh, it's, so that's growing. Quite a, it's growing very fast that's quite a bit i want to acknowledge uh chat here i'm uh tammy thompson moore who was just with us says no and she was complimenting my singing <laughs> uh sarah williams says sing it alex uh ryan alfred watching tuesday afternoon today uh and tammy moore once again watching so we have a few more minutes here i have a few more questions um, but I would like to give the chat uh, the opportunity. If you have any questions, if you have a son or a daughter or a family member um, that is, you know, I would say in their childhood 14 to maybe 30, um, that either is thinking about transitioning, has complex uh, medical needs um, through 18 to 21, 24 there, um, or if you have a loved one or you know somebody that is a little bit older that never received transition services. If you have any questions for our guests, please go ahead and put it in chat, and I will ask those on behalf of you. <clears throat> so we have 170 individuals served UAB and adding four to eight uh, new a week. How many do you estimate are eligible for this STEP program in Alabama? Yeah, so it's a difficult question to answer because how medical complexity is defined is again very much individualized so we intentionally kept um, it very broad on what condition you could have on you know and meaning what um, primary diagnosis you could have to come into step um, when we you know look at early data from children's there's thousands of patients who are seen in that transition age now certainly some of those patients are you know have a broken arm and come into children's hospital and and they definitely wouldn't be seen in a clinic like ours um, but for the patients that have multiple specialists um, that have you know any kind of you know chronic condition of childhood and and certainly you know more than one specialist or you know psychosocial kind of additional barriers um, I would think that the step clinic is certainly the the appropriate place for you um, in the beginning we thought that we would have patients that were you know closer to UAB would be our primary catchment and what we quickly realized is that families were already used to driving to Children's of Alabama if they had complex conditions and so if they felt like they could 
drive to Birmingham and get everything taken care of on one day um, with all of their providers. They were actually quite willing to do that, and so we've removed any you know um, distance cat, um, catchment. Um, but I would certainly say there's thousands of patients in Alabama that would be eligible for this program. Um, and do you think STEP will grow into that? So we meet regularly with um, Dr. Tony Jones, who's the um, chair of the Health Service Foundation, um, and he is very committed to our program and to our work. And um, so, you know, we are constantly in communication with administration on both sides um, on the importance of this work and in building it in a way that's sustainable and that can grow as our numbers grow. Um, we have a metrics meet, um, committee that meets monthly and, um, you know, the, the whole purpose of that is to continue to prove um, the worth of the um, of the program and to make sure that it can sustain its growth. It's nice to have those um, firm support systems, uh, you know, that, that support to fall back on and support you as you, as you continue to grow in the STEP program. How does someone get enrolled in the STEP program? Yeah, so um, if you're already a patient at, at Children's of Alabama, then chances are your physician's probably going to tell you about us. Um, if we, we certainly take self-referrals. Um, and so anybody that's 18 that wants to be seen in the STEP clinic, 18 or older, um, you can call the UAB Access Center at 205 801-7474. If you have questions about the STEP clinic, I'm always happy to answer those. Um, and my office number is 205-638-5281, or you can email me at betsy.hopson at childrensal.org. Are you okay with us putting that information in the chat? Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and as we come to the last part of our broadcast today, I always like to ask, uh, Mrs. Redeker, we'll start with you. Is there anything that we haven't talked about today that you think an individual or a family could benefit from hearing? Um, I'm going to make just the shout out that I always make to anyone who has a young person who will very likely need long-term care after 21. So if school services have been your daytime dependable place for your child to be socialized and you're going to need that after 21. Make sure that you are talking to your schools early about getting a true IQ score for your child prior to age 18. I know you all talk about ID waiver here. I've, I've watched the show, um, I've showed with Department of Mental Health. I just can't stress enough how much no one but a parent can really activate that particular program. And so when you come into STEP or you come into transition, we can give you the resource, we can give you the phone number, we can tell you what to do. We are not really able to make that um, service happen for you. And so my big shout out to all my families who know after 21, I'm not, you know, we're not gonna go into the workforce. We love to be with kids, we love to be social, we love to be around our peers, we don't wanna be staying at home all day please, please, please make sure you get an IQ score through your school system, through a neuropsychologist, through something prior to age 18 and activate intellectual disability waiver services. <laughs> totally not related to STEP or CRS. <laughs> That's my big thing. I think a lot of uh, parents and individuals figure that out a little too late. That is what, so we see that a ton in STEP. I see that a lot in transition just generally. Um, and so this is also to anyone who's a teacher, anyone who works with people who, who may qualify under the intellectual disability criteria, just please keep, keep repeating that messaging over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and school psychometrists, please, please don't zero them out mm -hmm. at 40 and say could not condition to testing. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that. Mrs. Hobson, if you would... Is there anything we haven't talked about that you think an individual or a family would benefit from hearing? Yeah, so, and some of this comes from my work with spina bifida before going into the step, but um, when I started the adult spina bifida clinic, one of my early observations is that a lot of times it didn't feel like I was getting the same adult patient as the pediatric patient that left me. It seemed like in the pediatric years that my patients had you know, kind of hopes and dreams and things that they plan to accomplish. And then by the time I saw them in the adult clinic and year after year, um, you know, something had happened where it seemed like 
those hopes and dreams and that light inside of them was becoming more dim. And I really wanted to understand that more. And all of the passion behind my work in transition has been to keep that light shining bright. Mm -hmm. And so the most important thing that I've learned certainly as a parent and that I think I can impart is that your child will see themselves exactly the way that you see them. So if you see them as perfectly able to accomplish and to conquer, then they're going to see themselves that way. And so as a health system, what I hope to be able, not that I'm a health system by myself, but <laughs> my role in the health system, what I hope to be able to do is to reduce the barrier to access of care so that they can go and accomplish and do all the great things that I know that they can do. And so that we can keep that light inside of them shining bright because the world absolutely, the workplace absolutely needs people who have had struggles and medical complexity and it makes all of us better when that's who's working beside me mm -hmm. absolutely very well said absolutely. both of you uh, don't put any extra don't put any limits on your children right mm -hmm. you know let them make their own way and the world world will help you get that and you got to go through some ups and downs and you'll build confidence doing that so right. um well we don't have any other questions at this point i want to thank everybody for being with us this this afternoon um, and at this point, we'll each look at our respective cameras and we will say, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank and you. And Clifton will take us out.